Hey, just a moment, I want to welcome all those who are right now watching on Facebook Live and YouTube. Come on, church family, let them know how much we're excited about them being here. Give me your very best. Come on, church, let's go. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're watching with us and all those at the Price Daniel unit. You're not a project to us. We consider you a part of our family, so thanks for tuning in today. So uh, in January 2011, I got the opportunity to go with Compassion International to Bolivia to do that, that, so we, we sponsor some kids, and uh, I got to see one of my kids there in Bolivia and got to go to one of the Compassion organizations. It's a phenomenal organization, and they let me bring somebody with me, and so Billy Maben, a lot of you know Billy, he went with me, and so we, we go to Bolivia, and we had two rules before we got there, is don't drink the water unless it's from a water bottle, and don't eat the fruit, simple enough. So we get there, and the director of Compassion International met us there, and he'd been to Bolivia many, many times. And so the first thing, before we actually went down uh, to their, their site, we got to go to a nicer restaurant. Just kind of a way to ingratiate us to the area. And so we went, we went to this restaurant, and he, he ordered a salad with fruit on it. And I'm like, that's like rule number one. I thought, and he said, well, it's really good here, and I think it's okay. So I was like... Okay, so something you may not know about me, I really like passion fruit. Now, I don't know what passion fruit is. I don't know what it looks like. Uh, it might look like a banana or a kumquat. I have no idea, but I really like the flavor of passion fruit. Passion fruit candy, passion fruit ice cream, passion fruit smoothies. If they made a passion fruit McNugget, I might be in love, all right? So I, don't, I just really like passion fruit. And they had a passion fruit smoothie, and I'm like, I, I kind of want to try it. So I got it. It was delectable, the most delicious smoothie I've ever had in my entire life. And that's not an exaggeration. So we served that week, and it was incredible. By the way, if you ever get a chance to go on an international mission trip, do it. Don't even hesitate, because you think you're going to do ministry, but what happens is you get ministered to. It's just it's a life-changing event. At the end of the week, we're about to get on the plane to come back to Miami. It's um, double-digit hours on the plane, and the director said, is there anything you want to do or anything you want to see before we go back to the airport? I said, I kind of want another one of those smoothies. So we went back to that restaurant. That's all we went. We went just to get another smoothie, and that one got me. I don't know what was in it. I don't know what happened, what was different, but I mean, I got so violently ill. I was so sick. And now I'm getting on a plane for like 10 hours, right, back to Miami, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bigger boy, but I'm in the middle seat between two bigger, bigger boys, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like crammed in the middle, and I'm getting hot, and I'm sweating, and I'm like turning the little air thing to try to get a little breeze, and I spent, I'm not lying, I spent more time in the bathroom, which is such a pleasant place to be on a plane, than I did in my actual seat. I was just thrown, it was, just, it was awful. It was so bad. I got home, I was sick for 11 days. 11 days. JC is like, I think you got a worm, you're going to die. I'm like, thanks for the encouragement, right? It's just, it's awful. It's awful. What's interesting, though, is that in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said there's something more dangerous than eating or drinking something that's bad, and that's actually speaking something that's bad. Here's what he says. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. And this thing that we have on the front of our faces is so powerful. Think about it. You could say something to me today that would totally bless me. It might even make my whole week. I've had that happen. Somebody says something on a Sunday, and by Friday I'm still beaming on that, that comment that was said. And conversely, you could say something to me that would completely destroy me. I could do the same to you. This, this is so incredibly powerful, and there's probably not a chapter in the Bible that talks about the tongue as well as James chapter 3. So let's look at it together. It's on your notes if you grab some on your way in. It says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So you think about a, a horse is a pretty big beast. You've got a 100-pound jockey. You've got the reins, and there's literally a 5-inch steel bit in the mouth of that horse, and that bit can turn the whole animal. Just a small steel bit. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So be it a horse or, or be it a ship, they are steered by, they are put in a direction towards, relative to their size, a very small instrument. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of our body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. This also can determine the direction. Are we going to move towards life? We're going to move towards death. We're going to move towards encouragement. We're going to move towards slandering and discouragement. This is a pretty powerful thing. It can set 
you on a course. Think about, I can think of a half dozen celebrities right now that lost their career, can't get gigs anymore, not because of something they did that was bad, because of something they said that was bad. You can think of people like that too. This thing gets us in a lot of trouble. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. That is really strong language. But it reminds me of Matthew 16 when Jesus is predicting his death, and Peter, one of Jesus' best friends, challenges Jesus, and he goes, never, this shall never happen to you, you'll never die. And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Now, he wasn't calling Peter Satan because Peter was one of his very best friends. But he's saying, in this moment, your tongue is set on fire by hell because you're not thinking about what God wants. You're thinking about what you want, Pete. You want me to stick around, but that's not God's plan for my life. I must die so that everyone can live. It's just incredible to think about that. Am I, am I using this for God's glory or is the enemy using this for destruction? All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. That's what I titled this message, Taming the Tongue. It's almost impossible, James would say. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Think about that. We can, we can tame an 8,000-pound female killer whale named Shamu. We can't tame this little pink thing in our mouth. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. So we can come in here, it's our, your breath and our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. And then Monday morning, we're cussing out that co-employee, that employee that we can't stand. Because you can't do that. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I have, I have this, this is something I struggle with too, okay? Especially uh, in, in traffic, <laughs> Thankfully, I live in Snyder now, so there's not a lot of traffic. When I lived in Austin, and this is pretty normal for me, right? I, I, I lived in Dripping Springs. I would drive into work, and 290 is a lot of cars, not a lot of road. You know what I'm talking about? So I, I was driving into work, and I remember I had spent a good time with the Lord that morning. I was feeling pretty good. I had some worship on. I was singing. It's like an old school hill song. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. And then I was pulling in, and this little white, tiny little car cut me off. And then it cut off somebody else. You know what I'm talking about? He's like, just, just, to get that, just to get that much quicker than me. And it just set me. I was shouting to the Lord. Now I'm shouting at him. I was, what are you doing? I was so frustrated. I said, I could run you into the barnage. I got a truck. Physics, man. I'll just run you off in the road. I'm bigger than you. It's just about, it happens. It happens. This thing gets us in a lot of trouble. And so your words spoken or typed out through thumbs in a text or an email are powerful. Eugene Peterson, which is one of the greatest gifts that God's ever given to the Christian body, he's now in heaven with the Lord. But Eugene wrote the message. He translated the message translation of the Bible. So he took the Bible and he put it in a modern day vernacular. So if you have a tough time reading the Bible, read the message. It reads more like a novel written in 2021 than the old English of King James Version. But here's what Eugene says in Matthew 12 as he's translating. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. And in the NIV translation, it says that we'll have to give an account of every idle word. In other words, we're speaking thousands and thousands of words every day. But we'll have to give an account for every idle word. So when I get to heaven, you don't get to heaven based on what you say. You get to heaven on based on what you believed about Jesus while you were on this earth. So everybody in the building, including myself, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We fall short. We sin. And sin separates us from God. And because sin separates us from God, it's not that God doesn't want to be in fellowship with us. He just can't because he's perfect. He's holy. He's set apart. It's kind of like the woman who's getting married and she's got on her wedding dress. And little brother comes in from playing in the mud and he's like, sissy! Right? And she's like, no, 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 baby. Right? Because it's not that she doesn't love him. I love you very much. I just can't be in your presence right now because you're dirty and I have on my wedding dress. 
in the same way God loves you, wants a relationship with you, but until you get cleaned up. And so the penalty for sin, the, 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 what is due for our sin is death. But God didn't give you what your sins deserve. He gave his son Jesus what your sins deserve instead. So Jesus died on the cross. That if you put your hope and your faith in a relationship with Jesus, you don't have to spiritually die one day. Jesus paid that price for you. So you get a better life on earth, John 10.10, 10, and abundant life in heaven, eternal life in heaven, John 3.16. It's pretty cool. But when you get to heaven, there's going to be a conversation you have. And part of that conversation with Jesus is, Reed, I gave you this thing. What would you do with it? How would you use it? Did you encourage or did you, did you discourage? Did you build others up? Did you tear others down? Let's actually, do you have your phone? Let me see your iPhone. Let's look through here. What's, what about this text to your sister? Right? Not, not in, a, in a condemning way or a harsh way, but just to say, this is a gift that I've given you. Why? Why did you use it for this purpose? Let's look at this Instagram post. Oh. Let's look at your Snapchat. I thought that was deleted after 24 hours. Nope, it's in the cloud, right? Like, (laughs) we're going to have to give an account for that stuff. And so, what are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? My, My message in a sentence, if Jesus is Lord of your life, he should be Lord of your lips too. Like, I can't just give him my life and not give him my lips. So, let's talk about our words for a minute, because words, again, are very, very powerful. Let's talk about them for a minute, and, and uh, let me give you a couple of facts about your words. First of all, your words impact others. They just do. Your words impact others. Uh, I could have given 400 verses. I really could have. I, I picked out four that I really, really like that I think uh, translate well to this idea that your words do impact others. Here's the first one, maybe my favorite, uh, Ephesians 4.29, do not let any. Like none unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, that it may benefit those who listen according to their needs. So I want to be a builder. I want to be a lifter. I want to be an encourager. I don't want to tear people down. I don't want to have unwholesome talk coming out of my mouth. I want to encourage people, encourage people. I have never met anybody that said, I've had it up to here with your encouragement. Stop it with the kindness right now. No, I've never met that person. Right? You're like, quit it. No, keep going. Keep going. I'll stop. What'd you say? Like you, you, we do. We, we want to be encouraged. I've, I've never been over-encouraged. You haven't either. We love to be encouraged. So let's don't let any wholesome talk come out of our mouths. Let's just build each other. Come on, church. Here's the next one. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You've heard, whoever said uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me was a fool. Because I would much rather have a stone thrown at me than a word lodged in my heart because that wound, the physical wound, will heal. In fact, they've done research. Research has shown that our brains and our bodies react to physical harm and verbal abuse in the exact same way. But as I said, I would much rather have physical harm done to me because that wound will heal. And some of you are still wrestling with something that some caring adult, a parent, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, a neighbor said to you years, decades ago. You're still wrestling with that. When I went to college, I had this grandiose idea of, of starting a media company. And we were going to do, we were going to dabble in everything. We, we had a radio show, an internationally syndicated radio show, and we were going to do television production, and, and we had a, a magazine. And the whole idea, everything, everything was not super super Christian, it was kind of the backdoor approach, like we were going to do something that was really good and high quality and then tell them about Jesus. It didn't necessarily on the front end look like a a Christian ministry. We were going to do a video game magazine, and I was really proud of this idea. It was something that's still not been done. I still think it's a good idea. And I found a friend of mine named Steve. We went to church together, and Steve was really gifted at graphic design, and I was a journalism major, so I was really good at writing articles. And together, between his graphics and my articles, we were going to make this magazine. So we were making this prototype. We were going to shop it to different vendors to see if somebody would publish it. And uh, we were really proud of this thing. It really looked pretty good. Well, we're getting pretty close to completion of of the magazine, and... uh, I, I get an email from Steve, and most of the email was pretty normal business. We were 50-50 partners in the deal, and, 
he was just talking about the magazine. And the, the very last line, it was something, I, I tried to find the email, but it's, it's been over 20 years. I don't even have that account anymore. But it was something along the lines of, uh, one day you're going to be working for me. Or something like that. And I got really frustrated. But that wasn't even your idea. This, I, this was my idea. <laughs> I was just, you know, I invited you to be a part of my project. Now you're telling me I'm going to be your, your like you're going to be my boss. Like I was so frustrated. And so I went over to his apartment and I knocked on his door. And he answered the door and I just laced into him. 60 straight seconds. I just, I just hit him with it. I was like, I can't believe that you would put that. I mean, I just let him have it. And he just standing there like this, just listening to the whole thing. And I got done and I felt like I just like, right, I just gave him one of those. And uh, he goes, I was just waiting for his response, and he goes, that was a joke. It's called sarcasm. Take foot out of mouth, right? I, I, can't, I can't read sarcasm in an f- email. I, so I tried to apologize, and he shut the door, and I have not talked to Steve since. I tried. I emailed him, I texted him called him, he will not talk to me. So I'm not saying this pointing ten fingers at you. I've got ten fingers pointing right back at me. This is something I struggle with, and I've gotten a lot better in the last 20 years, but this is a real issue. And words do shape us. I can prove it to you. You, you, you meet somebody, and, and hi, this is my daughter Jill. And oh, she's shy as Jill cowers behind her mother's legs because she's heard that modifier over her life a thousand times. And now she's become shy because that's what her mother introduces her as. This is Carlos. He's my wild child. As Carlos lets out a demonic laugh and sets a, a mesquite tree on fire, right? <laughs> Paris, be careful. I mean, I, this, she's my diva. Well, yes, she's, then she's going to grow up to be a diva because you continually told her she's a diva. Might be careful of the language that we use. Word shape us. And, and word shape us for the positive, too. I, I don't mean to leave anybody out, but, but there are people in this church, many of you, that really are encouragers to me and lift me up. And you can say something on a Sunday, and it carries me through to the next Sunday. And some of the ones that come to my mind that just are super encouragers are Carolyn Falkenberry. Carolyn is one of those people. James Jenkins is one of those people. Uh, Donna Liner is one of those people. Joe Beth Everett is one of those people. Uh, uh, Pat Cornett, Sue Gress. I mean, uh, there's a lot of them. There's more than that. But I'm just, they can. They just, they just, they build you up. You just, you, you oh, wow. And I know that I'm, I'm preaching for Jesus. I get that. But there are days that I'm like, I hope Carolyn likes this. Like I do. I think about it because I want, I want to make you happy. I, I want, I want to. I want to preach in a way that you send me that text and say, that, that, that ministered to me this morning. I want you to think about if, if I were to set a tape recorder in your home and I hit record, you didn't know it was there, and you just had normal conversation, and then I came back to my office a week later and I transcribed everything you said and I put it in a positive column or a negative column, which would weigh more? And my guess is in most homes it would be negative. We're just negative. We're negative, 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 negative. You're so lazy, you don't do anything. Get your boots off the coffee table. Get the cat out of the microwave. We're just constantly being negative about things. And it, it is. It's just like, it's just negative. Let me ask you a question, a little audience participation. How many of you prefer positive people over negative people? Raise your hand. Shocker, everybody in the building. Listen to me, listen to me. If you're always negative, you're conditioning the people in your life to not want to be around you. You just admit it. I don't like negative people. If I get around negative people, there are people that I've distanced myself from. I love them in Christ's name, but I, I'm, they're not my best friend because they're always negative. I can't, I can't do that all the time, so I have to create some space. I've done counseling where a husband is working 80 hours a week, which is wrong. And the wife is wanting me to just tell him it's wrong. But then I start doing a little digging, and I find out that she's a nagger. And I'm like, I get it now because it's more peaceful at the office than it is at home. And you're negative, but I love you. I always have to say I love you, make her feel better about herself. Like, but you've gotta, you can't be negative all the time because if you're always negative, he's never going to want to come home. Make your home a place of refuge and peace. 
Is this making sense? Is this landing on anybody? Just start somewhere. Some of you, you've heard of Rosetta Stone, learning another language. Some of you need a Rosetta Stone of encouragement. You just start somewhere. Son, you're breathing today. Good job. Whatever it takes, just start somewhere. <laughs> Get going. <laughs> And, and, and I would also, I would add to make it not performance-based, um, because then they're going to always be trying to get your, your approval through. A, uh, so I'll give you an example. So I coached my son's basketball team. We went undefeated. What, what? Uh, but he didn't always play good every week. And so if he has a good game, and I go, good game, buddy, then how's he going to feel when he has a bad game? Right? Dad's not happy with me. So I say after every game, hey, I'm proud of you. I love to watch you play. I'm honored to be your dad. That's what I, win or lose, good game, bad game, that's what he's going to hear every single time. So work, I'm telling you, it'll change. It'll change. Tongue of the wise is going to bring some healing. You got broken homes. Try it. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some of you, uh, if, if you're having trouble with this, it's probably because you're having trouble with this. And you need to spend more time in God's Word, and more time praying, and more time just worshiping. Turn off the secular music. I'm not against secular music. Just turn it off a little bit. Turn on some worship, and just, it'll just change. And you'll go, oh, my heart's better, and then my mouth starts speaking better. Here's the last one. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace. Grace is this beautiful word of someone, something someone doesn't deserve. Well, they were ugly to me. Well, I'm going to drench them with grace. Well, they were just being evil. I'm going to just give them even more grace. And temper it with truth and clarity. So it's okay to have hard conversations. In fact, Paul would say in Ephesians 4.15 to speak the truth in love. So I have, I have tough conversations all the time, but I do it in a loving way. So instead of saying, oh, you're always doing this. Could you please stop us? It would bless me if in the future there's just a way to navigate those conversations where you can have tough conversations but do it in a loving way. Does that make sense? Okay. So our words impact others. Here's a second one. Our words impact ourselves. You better believe it. So it's not just our spouse. It's not just our kids. It's not just our siblings or our parents or our friends. It impacts us. The person who speaks to you more than anybody else is you. Anybody else have a confidence committee that meets in your head at, at the round table? Is that just me? I have one, one guy stands up. His name is Past Experience. He's real vocal in those meetings. Like, look at all the mistakes. He's got a PowerPoint presentation. Look, Reed, you don't need to do this. Look at all the times you've messed up. But you do. You, you, you can negative talk yourself and you're not doing what God wants you to do. About six years ago, I was really struggling with, uh, with this, with negative self-talk. And uh, I remember I'd had two failures in a row, pretty substantial failures. And I was feeling that. And I was like, I, I was, have I missed my calling? Have I lost the favor of God? I was just really confused by the whole thing. And I was in my closet. I'll never forget, that was the day that I fired my personal critic, which was me. And two seconds later, hired my personal coach. Because a critic, all a critic does is just go, bad job, way to go, bub. Right? He, just, he, he doesn't have any skin in the game. But a coach, he's got blood, sweat, tears involved. Man, he, he's for you. So the coach is like, hey, it's okay. You got knocked out. Get up. Come on, Reed, let's go. You got a plan. Run the play. And then I turn on Survivor, Eye of the Tiger, and I feel a whole lot better about myself. <laughs> but they do impact yourself. Here's the last one. Our words impact our circumstances. It does. Your words actually do impact your circumstances. This is what Jesus said, not me. This is what Jesus said. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So he doesn't say think about the mountain. He says actually say it to the mountain. Move. And the mountain will move. Your, your words can impact your circumstances. So when I was in Austin uh, serving at a, another church, we did a thing called Miracle Month. And the pastor, the lead pastor, I was associate, the lead pastor uh, would always talk about um, miracles. He was doing all the miracles of the Bible. And then he said, if you want a miracle, come down and we'll pray for you. And people came down with some pretty bizarre requests. And I grew up in this church, Colonial Hill Baptist, and, and I don't know if it's this Baptist thing or what, but I used to always pray, Lord, if it's what? Your will. Y'all have heard it too, right? And that's the easiest scapegoat, right? Because you're like, we well, didn't do it. It's not his will, right? Or, 
If he does do it, it's like, good job. Like, but I, I just, for the first time in my life, said, I'm not going to pray that. I'm going to say, Lord, do it. We had a guy named John Garza who had terminal, you know what that means, terminal cancer, terminal cancer, terminal cancer. Without radiation, without chemotherapy, he got completely miraculously healed. We prayed for him. Had another lady named Margarita White. Margarita had a split aorta of her heart. They gave her a 10% chance to make it through the night. They gave her a 10% chance, a less than 10% chance to make it through surgery. Once she made it through surgery, she had less than a 40% chance to actually make it through the next night. I mean, they just kept giving her odds that were not in her favor, and she's doing well, and her heart's beating well today. Today. Had another family, the Martinez family, who were, were going to give birth to a baby, and they had gone to the, uh, to the doctor on Thursday. They had done a sonogram, and the heart had stopped. The heartbeat had stopped on the baby. And so she came down. Well, these other things had already started to happen. So, like, our faith is growing as a staff. And so our pastoral team, we just, we like, let's just pray. So we prayed over her womb. We said, God, start the heart. Let's go. You, you started it once, started it again. And she went in on Monday, and that heart has started. That baby's now fine and healthy as a toddler now. Crazy cool. Yeah, amen. Those aren't people in Rwanda or Uganda. These are people that I know. We said, God, move that mountain, and he moved the mountain. It will change your circumstances. So some of you are saying, okay, I'm in. Pastor Reed, I'm in. My words matter. My, this is a big, powerful thing. Well, what do I do? Three quick steps. I'm going to go through them quick, right quick. First is you've got to pause. I love awkward silence. Just pause. In fact, James would say it this way. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Slow to become angry. If you'll pause, you'll actually fix this one too. I might still have a friend in Steve today had I just paused and gone, you know what? He's never said anything that alluded to him being uh, this way. I, I probably should get some clarity before I lace into him. So much of our communication is reactionary. And let's just, let's just agree that we're not going to have these big hairy conversations over text or email because you cannot read tone, you cannot read mood, you cannot read inflection over words on a screen. So if you get something and it, and it makes you kind of go, what? Let's have a conversation. Can you clarify what you meant? I, I might have been reading that wrong. Pause. Second one's ponder. So think about it. So every, especially during hairy conversations, I'll ask two questions. Does this need to be said? And a lot of times the answer is no. And I was, okay. And I don't say it because it wasn't true, it wasn't helpful, it wasn't kind. But sometimes it's yes. And I'll ask the second question, does it need to be said right now? So sometimes it needs to be said, it just, it, I need to wait a beat. You know what I'm talking, y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? When, when you needed to borrow 20 bucks from dad on a Sunday and you went in there and the Cowboys just lost, you got, I'm not asking him right now. Right? You're not asking him because you can tell it's going to be a no. But if you walk in and the Cowboys just beat the Patriots on a last second touchdown to CeeDee Lamb, you're going, hey, dad, can I have 40 bucks? Right? Like, yeah. Right? You just, you know, when I ask it, I need to ask it. Should I ask it now? I probably should wait. There's some emotion. So ponder. And if all else fails, just pray. Let's pray. In fact, Luke 12, 12 says the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. I pray when I come up on the stage. Every, every time, every Sunday, I say, Lord, if there's something, I memorize my text, obviously, but I say, Lord, if there's something I'm supposed to say that's not in my notes, bring it to my mind. And if there's something I'm not supposed to say, erase it from my mind. I, like, I really want these to be your words, not my own. In fact, let's pray together now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all the people that are here today and watching online. And uh, it's something we struggle with. And I'm chief among us. We, we, we struggle with this tongue. And it is a restless evil, full of deadly poison, as your word says it is. But it can also be life-giving. And it can be an encouragement. And it can be a breath of fresh air to the people we do life with. So God, I pray that you would help us to not let any unwholesome talk come out of these mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up. God, I pray that we as a church could do that really well in the church. Jesus, you said in John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another, and by this everyone's going to know you're my disciples. 
if you have love one for another. And you're talking about, in that context, loving other people in the church. Like the rest of Snyder's going to know, the rest of Snyder's going to know that we're following you because we love each other. And one of the ways we can love each other best is with the words that come out of our mouths. Let us love, be a loving place, be an inviting, a warm, a welcoming place where people come in and say, man, I just, I didn't feel judgment. I felt the love of God in that building. Lord, I know that there are people here that have never placed their faith in you. They're like that little muddy boy coming up to the sister with a wedding dress, and they know that they shouldn't be in the presence of you, but you have made a way. And that is through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. So God, if there's somebody here who needs to start with you, or maybe start over with you, I pray they would pray this, pray this prayer with me. Go ahead and pray it with me. Just out loud in your seat. You just, under your breath is fine. Just mean it is the real thing. Say, Lord Jesus. I believe that you gave your life for me, that you were buried and that you rose again, beating death and beating hell, and giving me the power to do the same by putting my faith in you. I'm asking you to come into my life, be my Savior, forgive me of all my sins, and to be my Lord. I'm putting you in charge from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I know somebody did. I felt that in my spirit. So if you prayed that prayer, I want you just to text the word SAVED to that number, 325-221-3001. What's that mean? Well, it's going to send you a text asking for your physical address. I promise I'm not coming by unless you ask me to. I'm not even going to call you unless you ask me to. I just want to send you some resources in the next couple of days that are going to help you. You took one step by praying that prayer. This is step two. I want to help you by sending you some stuff in the mail. Um, they're, they're good resources. They're not cheesy. Okay, We don't do cheese here. We, we, <laughs> they're good. They're helpful. They'll be, they'll be a good read for you.